Uh, welcome to lesson number 5 of the course on industrial automation and control. Today we are <coughs> going to talk about pressure, force and torque sensors. These sensors are used in a variety of contexts both for the process industry as well as the manufacturing industry. So, uh, let us look at the instructional objectives as is the practice first. So, the instructional objectives are the following. <coughs> Number one, to understand the basic principles of operation of various uh, pressure gauges which work in various pressure ranges. To describe the principles of operation of different force and torque measurement systems and most of them use many of them use the so called strain gauges. So, to understand the basic principle of measurement with strain gauges. So, uh, it turns out as we have learnt earlier that when we want to get the value of a physical variable from one form to an electrical form which is convenient to uh, sense, to process, to display. The this transformation from the variable that we want to actually measure and its electrical form actually goes through a number of stages as we have learnt. So, <coughs> it gets transformed to some intermediate forms and these transformations each of them in turn are sometimes achieved through sensors. So, in an, in, an, in an overall measurement system you often find that there are a number of sensors. The sensor which actually senses the physical variable that we finally want to measure is often called a primary sensor and it may not deliver the, uh, the measurement of that variable in an electrical form. <coughs> so, we have to use other sensors and sometimes uh, and, and, and after that we have to, to get it into a more convenient electrical form in the, in the form that we need is a voltage value, frequency. We need further electronic circuits generally electronic or electrical circuits which are called signal conditioning and processing circuits. So, we have learnt about this in our basic uh, instrumentation um, basic <coughs> measurement systems lesson before. So, this architecture is very much relevant in the case of pressure force and torque measurement therefore, we will review it. So, we will understand. So, therefore, look at this picture basically a block diagram where we have the physical medium. It is, it is in the physical medium that we want to this is the medium where the variable of interest exists variable of interest it may be temperature it may be pressure whatever in this case we are in we are interested in pressure force etcetera. <coughs> that pressure will be transformed first it will be sensed by a primary sensing element something that will Set, we, that will produce another variable which will be roughly or accurately proportional to the pressure. So, that variable may be uh, it may be a displacement <coughs> it may be uh, mm, that now suppose it is a displacement or, or it may be a strain. So, whatever it is that displacement or strain is not in electrical form. So, therefore, we have to use some other sensor along with this. So, first we have an element which will which, trans, which transforms so let us say pressure into displacement or strain. Then we put, we put another sensor which, which, which we are calling the. So, the this, this, this element which say con converts pressure to something else is the primary sensing element. Then we have the secondary sensing element which will sense this, this in variable which is produced by the primary sensing element and will convert it to some other form closer to an electronic form may be resistance may be capacitance whatever. And then finally, we will have a signal conditioning circuit 
which will transform this resistance capacitance change into a into a corresponding uh, voltage let us see. So, you see that essentially for these sensors the trans transformation or the measurement will be achieved using a number of sensors this is the point that I wanted to make. So, coming back uh, so as a typically as a as a primary sensor we use displacement or strain sometimes uh, all the time we need not have a uh, primary sense uh, I mean we, we can we can sometimes have only a primary sensor it is not that at every time we will need a secondary sensor also sometimes uh, pressure value can be I mean directly we can we will be able to produce an electrical form that also is possible, but generally there will be a primary sensor and generally this primary sensor converts the pressure force and torque into an equivalent displacement or strain. Then we have a secondary sensor which will take this displacement or strain and will produce generally produce a resistance or a capacitance change. And finally, we will have the signal conditioning circuit which will where this element where the resistance or the capacitance change takes place will be a part of a circuit and therefore, there will be a there will be a voltage produced sometimes voltage sometimes change in frequency also may be produced where uh, which will be proportional to this change in resistance. So, this is the basic architecture which will be uh, evident in most of the sensing systems that we are going to see here. Now, uh, so we will first talk about pressure measurements which are you know low pressure in tens of 10 twenties of psi may be lower. So, we will we'll, we'll typically review these three measurement systems one is a Pirani gauge, the second is a thermocouple gauge and the fourth is an ionization gauge. Now, here I must mention that one of the one of the one of the simplest methods and one of the oldest methods and perhaps one of the most accurate methods of uh, pressure measurement is well known as the as the so called uh, U tube manometer. So, that principle just we are mentioning because we are not mention going to mention it in detail because generally this principle is not so much used for industrial online measurements they are more used in in laboratories. Uh, so, therefore, uh, we will uh, not treat this in detail, but but we all uh, know this that that the that the basic principle is that you have let me change my pen. So, the basic principle is that you have one vessel and where there is some liquid and suppose you have uh, you have another vessel. So, if you have a pressure on this as P, then the this liquid will be forced into this and it will rise above a certain level. So, this pressure basically force balance. So, this pressure will be equal to the standard formula that is if this is the height h and if if the density of the liquid is rho and if the force of gravitation is g then p is equal to h rho g. So, we measure h and we sense the pressure p this is this is the famous uh, barometric principle uh, sometimes you can have you can have you can have various variants of this uh, this uh, principle you can have a you can have a manometer which is a, which is an u tube. So, if you put pressure on one side and then you will create a you, you will actually create a level difference that is the liquid column on this will be higher. So, you can measure the pressure by sensing the difference in the liquid columns again. So, if this is H and if this is P then you can again 
sense the difference. So, these are very standard one of the one of the one of the earliest methods of uh, pressure measurement, but we are not going to speak much about them because they are generally not so much used in an industrial context, but used more in a laboratory context. So, coming back we will we will look at the Pirani gauge, the thermocouple gauge and the ionization gauge. So, let us look at them one by one. In the Pirani gauge incidentally in the in the Pirani gauge uh, you can say that there is no secondary sensor. So, the effect of the pressure basically the Pirani gauge uh, says that if in a it is used for measuring pressure of gases. So, if you have and is and is used for measuring low very low pressure. So, if the pressure is very low then the number of molecules which exist in the gas are going to be low. Now, if you have a heated object inside that gas then heat will be conducted through the gas. So, the so the heated object will lose heat by thermal conduction through the gas and the amount of heat that will be carried away from the from that heated object by the gas obviously depends on the number of molecules present in in the per unit volume in the gas which is proportional to the pressure. So, if the pressure is high then the then more heat will be taken away if the pressure is low then less heat will be taken away. So, therefore, an electrically heated filament is placed inside a, a vacuum space vacuum space means very low pressure space. Then the lower the pressure then the then the lower the thermal conductivity of the medium and higher the temperature of the resistance because less heat is being taken away. So, the temperature of the of the filament will increase therefore, its resistance will increase. So, if we put that filament into a circuit we can directly sense the resistance change. So, it is measured by a bridge circuit. So, you see that here the what is the principle used? The principle used is that the thermal conductivity of low pressure gas depends on its pressure. So, the so the pressure is directly through the same element which is the filament the pressure affects the thermal conductivity which affects the temperature which affects the resistance all this this serial effect is within the same sensor. So, in this case we can say that there is no explicit secondary sensor and this filament is directly put into a signal conditioning circuit which is the bridge and the resistance change will give us a measure of the pressure. So, obviously, it is also possible to measure it online. So, you simply put it in a bridge circuit. So, you have this is the this is the measuring element in which you want to measure the pressure. So, you are subjecting the the, the pressure is actually applied here. So, the pressure is actually applied here. This element is actually a compensating element which takes care of see the see the temperature of the filament will actually depend on many things. It will depend on the pressure certainly. It will also depend on the ambient temperature because the heat flowing out depends not only on the thermal conductivity, but also on the temperature difference between the filament and its environment. So, if the ambient temperature changes then this is this is actually a you can say an interfering or a it is actually an interfering input. So, this can be compensated by this compensating element and then you have a normal Wheatstone's bridge which will give you an output which is uh, which will show you the pressure. So, this is a case where only a primary sensor is used. Similarly, exactly similar principle use is, is used in the thermocouple gauge. In the thermocouple gauge we are doing exactly the same thing. We again have a, a filament, we again heat it up using a current and we again try to measure its temperature which will depend on the pressure in the in the same way only thing is that in this case we do not depend on uh, we, we do not sense its resistance change, but rather we directly put a thermocouple 
on that on that heated object which will give a voltage which is proportional to the temp to the to the, to the temperature of that object in fact in fact one can use here also one can use a compensating element for example uh, here also one can use a compensating element so you can have two such sensors so you can have one coil here and another coil here both of them can be driven say by some some voltage source which may be a which may be a normal ac source like a transformer so you have the transformer primary and you have two secondaries wound on the same core so if the primary voltage varies so you have the transformer and you connect one thermocouple here and another thermocouple here so these two positive wires of the thermocouple are connected and the negative wires are taken out as output so this is one output and this is the other output so these two are the plus wires and these are the minus wires so this so in in this case this is the basic basically your extension of this so you are using this is a compensating element and here you can input the pressure this is sealed in vacuum so you first create very low vacuum 10 to the power minus 5 kind of psi kind of uh, pressure and then you seal it so this can be so 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 now the now the this voltage this voltage will be a measure of the pressure in this case we are using a secondary sensor which is the thermocouple which senses temperature so in this case the uh, the secondary we have we had made said that the generally the primary sensor transforms into displacement or strain but in this case it is being transformed to a temperature then we have an ionization gauge which is also used for sensing uh, very low pressure so what we are doing here is here also we do not have an explicit secondary sensor this principle is different this principle is that in from this cathode you have a, a stream of electrons are produced right and you see that between these cathode and this plate there is a uh, there is a large voltage applied so what happens is that during this in this zone in this zone there are there these speeding electrons which come out from the cathode bombard the molecules of the gas so the gas is here and they displace some electrons from the, those molecules and there, therefore the gas molecules generate a an, an an ion pair one is the heavy positively charged ion and the other is a negatively charged uh, other is basically an electron so what happens is that this these positively charged ions actually come and get collected in this so called uh, grid and the and the electrons as usual travel along with the along with the electrons which is created by the cathode to the plate and gets collected in the electron collector so you see that the that the electron current is basically the sum of these cathode electrons which are which is much larger in number and the electrons created here which are which are smaller in number so therefore this electron current remains more or less constant while this ion current which is produced which is entirely due to the uh, due to due to those uh, positive ions which have been produced by electron bombardment they are the ones which get collected so it is this current which is a measure of the pressure because 
the current will be higher if the if an if the number of positive ions produced will be higher and the number of positive ions produced will be higher if two things if the number of uh, uh, basically if the if the number of molecules per unit volume is higher because we are we are keeping the number of electrons coming from the cathode to be constant so we are so we are so the cathode current is more or less kept constant so the ion current will depend on the pressure so in this case you see by directly this 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 pressure is can be sensed in terms of the current so even you can say that even a signal conditioning circuit is also included here so you so you just measure the current so this these are the three gauges that we <coughs> that are and we used to measure lower pressures so now we'll move on to other measurement schemes which sense higher pressures of the order of thousands of psi of course the diaphragm of course the, the diaphragm gauge can measure pressure at a at lower values also so coming to the first the bordeaux gauge the the basic principle so ah right so before that let us so all the sensors both the both the bordeaux gauge the diaphragm gauge and the bellows have come in you know various flavors so for example a, a bordeaux gauge can be the well known c type gauges we'll see one of them and if you extend the tube you can make it into a spiral which will give better sensitivity in the sense that it will give uh, the bordeaux gauge actually converts pressure into a displacement so if you use a spiral you will get a higher displacement similarly if you have a i mean you can have a diaphragm where you where it can be a flat diaphragm sometimes it can be a it, it can be a stretched diaphragm in the sense that uh, to keep the diaphragm taut you need to apply a pressure sometimes they are thin plate diaphragms where which can which which are anyway uh, taut because their thickness is more sometimes you can have capsules where you can apply pressure from both ends and sometimes when you want to have higher displacement for these diaphragms then you make the diaphragm corrugated so you you actually you can if you have you you actually make the diaphragm corrugated so that for a given pressure application the displacement because there are, there is a, there is a lot of play here so this diaphragm can actually stretch much higher if you made very straight probably it would have stretched only this much but because it is corrugated so now the corrugations can expand and it can give you a higher displacement although that comes sometimes with an amount of non linearity similarly bellows can be either absolute or differential in the sense that if you are bellow is <coughs> again you know uh, something like a something like a diaphragm which whose ends are not fixed so therefore the rather than the diaphragm uh, moving due to uh, moving it can it can actually physically move because the, because the whole diaphragm is actually put on a movable element we will we, we'll see that so coming to the c type bordeaux tube this is the usual bordeaux tube so you you can see the different parts for example this is the place where the pressure is actually applied so it's a it, it, it's a it, it's a tube which is connected to the region where you want to measure the pressure and this pressure is comes into this pipe now the most interesting thing is that this pipe actually has a oval cross section this is the crucial point about both the gauges so whenever you apply pressure this cross section tends to become because of the pressure it will tend to become roundish so the tube the tube is like this when it will have pressure it will have a tendency of stretching out into a into a square circular cross section right so uh, it will have a tendency of stretching out into a circular cross section and this stretching out actually creates this stretching out actually creates forces such that this end this end this is the movable end 
this is the movable end. So, because this is stretching out, this movable end will move and that is now connected to some you know mechanisms, links and other things and so here you have a you know a, a ratchet kind of mechanism and so the ratchet moves, this, this moves a pointer there is a spring. So, this all these are actually just simple motion translating mechanism such that you get a movement of the pointer on the scale. So, the basic idea is that you have a tube which is of oval cross section which will stretch as the pressure is applied and because of this stretching this end will move. Now, because this end moves and it is connected to a mechanism, so therefore the pointer will move. Now, it is not necessary that you have to connect it to a mechanism like this, this is this particular diagram happens to be an indicating instrument. So, therefore, it is connected like this, you can you can you can also connect it to any position sensing equipment something like an LVDT whatever or a or a or a magnetic uh, position sensor anything uh, and then that position can be transformed again to an electrical form. So, this is the in this case this mechanism actually is the secondary sensor. So, the primary sensor produces using pressure it actually first produces strain, but that strain is actually produced strain and the and but, but that strain in turn produces a displacement of the C tube end which is sensed by a secondary sensor. Very simple as such it can measure pressures up to very high ranges 100,000 psi kind of not 100,000 maybe 20,000 psi type of values. Then you have uh, bellow gauges. So, bellow gauges are used for lower pressures, they give higher displacements and uh, so, the, so, the basic idea here is again that as I was telling that you apply the pressure here this is an element which senses the pressure actually the pressure is sensed as a force. Now, rather than in, in the case of now here in this case what happens is that this force will push these up. So, there will be a it is like a it is like a spring there is there, there, are, there are springs inside and there are bellows you know bellows are uh, mechanical elements which are uh, which are organized like a in this uh, it is actually a cylindrical thing it is actually a cylindrical thing which has uh, which has corrugations it is a it is a it is a closed surface and obviously, if there is pressure this thing will move. So, the so the uh, the the gaps will close and this up this will move up it is generally used to move up at a particular against a particular spring. So, that it comes to rest and this position now because 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 the spring has a certain spring constant. So, this pressure is equal to P is equal to uh, basically the force created F is equal to P into A where A is this area and this will this F will be again equal to K into X where K is the spring constant. So, therefore, the pressure will be equal to K, K by A into X. So, if you sense X K and A are fixed constants, so you can sense pressure. And, and as I was telling that if in, in this case if this end is vacuum sealed or if this end is open to the atmosphere then you will if, if, if it is open to the atmosphere then you will sense what is known as gauge pressure that is the displacement will be proportional to the to the amount by which this applied pressure exceeds the atmospheric pressure. On the other hand you can sometimes other than having an absolute pressure measurement you can also have a differential pressure measurement. So, if you apply a pressure P 1 here and a pressure P 2 here then this displacement will be uh, will be a measure of the differential pressure which means P 2 by P 1 P 2 minus P 1 actually. So, uh, so, as we said that the same principle can be very well used to measure either absolute pressure or absolute pressure means if, if, if this end is sealed with a vacuum or gauge pressure or differential pressure. 
So, finally again we have a here, here we have a, so this is our, this is this position. So, here also pressure is transduced to a position and it goes to a uh, secondary sensor. Next we come to the diaphragm gauges. Diaphragm gauges are uh, very well used because of a number of factors that they take small areas, they can be constructed in for wide ranges of pressure, they are very amenable to, uh, they are very amenable to uh, online measurement, etc. So, coming to that, so here we have a, first we are using the principle of a diaphragm, uh, which is in this case it is actually a stretched, you know, you can, it depends on the range. If you have a if you use a very small range, then you sometimes in the place of the diaphragm, you use a membrane. Actually what you want is that you should get a certain amount of displacement, which can be accurately sensed for that range of pressure. So, if you have lower range of pressure, now, now obviously for a, for a given range of pressure, how much a displacement will be that will depend on the thickness of the membrane. So, if you have lower range of pressure, you sometimes create take a take uh, you know things like membranes which are stretched something like you know when we when we seal you know teams then we have we have we are often sealed them by uh, aluminum membranes so membranes are different from plates in the sense that membranes deflect under their own weights I mean, have you seen those tins where the where the where, where the top membrane is you know kind of loose because it, it cannot support its own weight it is it, it is so thin on the other hand plates uh, are used for higher pressure ranges, they can support their own weight. So, depending on uh, the range, you can use either a plate or the membrane. Membranes have to be kept stretched because unless they are stretched, they, they, they do not have a neutral position. So, in this case, we have a, so look at this, here we are trying to, you see, these are the two pressure ports, we are trying to sense differential pressure. So, we want to sense the pressure difference between two ports. So, one here we have one port which is P1, here we have another port which is P2. Now, these ports and this, this pressure actually comes through into here. So, you have, you know, there are, there are holes here and there are holes here through which the pressure comes into the here. Now, these are the fixed parts. This surface, this, this is sometimes made of glass. So, this is a fixed surface, this is this is full glass, fixed surface on which you can make on this surface, you can deposit, deposit metal and form an electrode. to form electrode. So, you see that it, here is one electrode, this surface is one electrode, this surface is another electrode and this is the movable plate. So, actually you have formed two parallel plate capacitors, these are the two fixed plates and there is one plate which moves, this is the this is the membrane or plate, movable plate. So, as it goes this way or as it goes this way, epsilon naught A by D is, epsilon naught A by D is capacitance. So, therefore, if this D 1 decreases, then this capacitance C 1 will go up. Similarly, when it comes bends this way, then this one D 2 decreases and therefore, C 2 goes up. So, you have formed two differential capacitors and if the moving plate moves this side, then this capacitance is increased, this capacitance is decreased. So, now you can use these capacitances in a, in a, in a, in a normal bridge right. So, the signal conditioning circuit is a simple bridge like this, where 
you have oh oh just a moment so the signal condition so here you have c1 and here you have c2 so as the membrane moves this can go up this can go down or this can go up this can go down so since these resistances are fixed that will create an that will create a an emf now we must note that this is if this is an ac source then this motion or the pressure fluctuations if you have pressure fluctuations then this pressure fluctuations will actually cause will create a modulated wave because this itself is ac so the, they will create a modulated output which has to be demodulated so we will learn about that when we learn about lvdt's that is how uh, amplitude modulated ac waves can be demodulated right now we are not discussing that so coming to the next one we have uh, so now that that was one use of diaphragm where the diaphragm where the movable diaphragm was used as a as the movable plate of two capacitors which two of which had fixed plates and this movable plate created a push pull capacitance sensor now we will see another application of diaphragms where we use uh, where we use uh, strain, mainly use strain gauges sometimes you can use also other uh, uh, other position sensors but mainly use strain gauges to measure pressure so as i said that diaphragms are used for low and middle pressure ranges so they can be used for measuring yeah middle quite good pressure 10 to the power 4 kilopascals they can also be used for low pressure measurement by low pressure i don't mean extreme low pressure which are measured by things like you know ionization and pirani gauges both so in the diaphragm as we will just see the diaphragm in the diaphragm both tension and and compression stresses exist on the diaphragm so we have to use them in a push pull configuration and we can use a four active arm bridge which will give better sensitivity it it, it as we know that if we have more than one act, we have we have four active arm bridges then we get some benefits like improved sensitivity improved linearity we get uh, improved temperature compensation so all these things are possible if uh, using 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 things like strain gauges on this diaphragm so we'll look at that so this is a diaphragm okay so this is a plate so you see that this is the unstressed this is the sort of a neutral position and this is the position under pressure so you have actually it, it looks somewhat like this it bends this is an exaggerated picture so you see that here obviously now you see that the the diaphragm this is a side view this is what you are being shown is side view so, so similarly you have top views so in the diaphragm you can have as you press the diaphragm suppose you apply force from the top or if you apply force from the bottom you are going to have two kinds of strains so one you are going to have strains which are you know uh, uh, one you are going to have radial strains so you are going to have radial strains and you are going to have circumferential strains and it turns out that because in this part of the diaphragm actually gets stretched this part of the diaphragm actually gets stretched so you have positive radial strain positive radial strain so the so that so the thing wants to stretch along the the thing wants to stretch both along the radius and you have positive circumferential strain because the because the, because the whole element tries to expand so on the circumferential on the circumference also that is the tangential strain is also positive on the other hand when you come to the to to near this point you know where this bend takes place there you have compression 
so the so you have so the radial strain also goes negative and the so there you have because it is clamped on one side and stretched on the other side. So, so here in this zone you have compressive strains. So, you, so this both the tensile uh, both the tangential and the radial strains go negative. So, this gives a kind of this gives an idea about the stress distribution or the strain distribution which occurs in the diaphragm. Now, we have to exploit this by using strain gauges. So, So, what we do is we put strain gauges on this diaphragm. See a strain gauge is actually something like this a strain gauge suppose we take a take a foil gauge where you have thin metal dis deposition and a long you make a long wire on a foil. So, what happens is that this also has some thickness and this part the thickness is made large, this part the thickness is made small. Like this. Okay. So, because you said you see if you make it like this, then what happens is that this is the the resistance of this will change due to strain. Now, strain can be in this direction, strain can also be in this direction, that strain can be broken up into components. Now, it turns out that <coughs> because these parts are made thicker and this is longish, most of its length is along this direction. So, therefore, this is predominantly sensitive to strains along this direction and very less sensitive to strains along the perpendicular direction. So, that is why we, so we have placed two st <coughs> strain gauges is 2 and 4. What kind of strain they sense? They sense radial strain because they are oriented along the radius while this 1 and 3 they sense strains along these directions. So, they are circum they are tangential strains. So, now what will happen according to our stress distribution? these two will sense radial compressive strain while these two will sense circumferential <coughs> uh, tensile strain. So, sometimes rather than putting discrete foil gauges we can make one big rosette see the same thing these sensed these are this these two r1 uh, r2 and r4 these sense radial strain see that they are they are arranged along the radius their sensitive axis while this r1 and r3 see their lengths are along this so these are sensing tangential strain. And these are the electrodes through which, through which you take connection. So, now you have four resistances <coughs> and you can put them in a bridge. It turns out that the what, 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 what how is the resistance change related to the strain. So, if you have that is that that factor in the, in the case of strain gauges is called a gauge factor. So, the gauge factor is the percent resistance change for I mean per unit strain. See the strain in that direction is actually d L by L, d L by L is the along the orientation axis of the strain gauge how much length change. So, d L by L is the strain and d R by R is the fractional resistance change. This resistance change can be actually attributed to three factors. One is the resistance change due to the change of length. So, the length of the wire itself will increase because the volume must remain same. So, therefore, it is there will be a change in area and that change in area is this is the resistance change due to the change in area because resistance depends on length as well as area. This nu is the Poisson's uh, ratio 
So, if you it says that if the resist length if you pull a wire and if you if its length increases by delta L then its area will also decrease by delta A because the overall volume must remain constant. Similarly, due to force sometimes there is a resistivity change this is very pre, very predominant in uh, semiconductor strain gauges. So, uh, in fact, I mean, I mean semiconductor strain gauges have, have much more sensitivity than metal strain gauges and this is basically due to the fact that uh, that you have uh, large uh, resistivity changes in, in semiconductor strain gauges and although they are they have great sensitivity they are also very sensitive to temperature. So, that is the disadvantage. So, in any case we are going to have depending on the gauge factor we are going to have resistance change which is proportional to the strain and the strain is proportional to the pressure. So, that is how we sense pressure. So, we put them you know R 1 and R 3, R 2 and R 4 on these two sides again standard with stone switch principle and we can get a output. The same principle can be used in a in a in a variety of configurations. For example, when if you are this is a standard weight measurement um, principle which is used in the industry weighing 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 cells. So, you have this is a this is a cylindrical mechanical member this is a cylindrical mechanical member. So, if you put pressure if you put force on it either up or down say by say the trucks are weighed. So, if you put a large object on it then on then this there will be there will be deformations on this member there will be strain created and if you put strain gauges then you can put the strain gauges. You see this one suppose you put a weight on it then this one will undergo compressive strain and because this will undergo compressive strain this will undergo tensile strain. So, now so this is axial along the axis and this is transverse along the perpendicular to the axis. So, you can have 4 such gauges this will go th resistance will ch change will be negative resistance will uh, resistance will be lower here the, the resistance resistance will increase. So, you put them in in opposition in the bridge and get a voltage. Similarly, you can have various other mechanical configurations. So, you can have a we have put a cylindrical we have put a pillar type cell where we load vertically. We can have also have a cantilever type cell where we can uh, where we are applying the force here suppose we hang the weight from here and we are putting the load cells at the base and we can put the load cells two of them on the top surface two of them on the on the bottom surface. So, two and four are on the bottom surface. So, what happens is that when you hang a weight these will undergo tensile see the beam will bend oh I am pressing this every time. So, the beam will bend and therefore, this surface you will have tensile and this surface you will have compressive strain. So, you can put gauges 2 and 4 on this surface in the exactly in the same manner and 1 and 3 as shown and then again put them in a bridge and because they are the same place. So, they can provide excellent temperature compensation. So, if the ambient temperature changes the resistance change in the temperature is going to be completely cancelled. In the same now the same principle we can use with uh, for for torque sensing. So, this is a very this is a very common application we are, we are talking of again we are talking of torque sensing as it uh, online torque sensing we are not talking of you know uh, dynamometer type torque sensing where we actually stop the member which is rotating uh, from rotating and uh, then we measure the torque that is used for I mean calibration purposes. But here we are talking about torque sensing as the equipment is working or as the member is rotating typical application is rolling mills. So, you know rolling mills have very large rolls one of them this is the roll this is one of them is generally free another is driven by a motor and a bar a metal bar 
which is which, which may be hot is passed through this. So, when it comes out it becomes rolled into a lesser width and there is tremendous torque generated on this. So, there is actually a so, so, so the motor this is the shaft right this, this is the shaft of the roll which is being driven and on this side you have the motor. So, there is so much rolling force required that this shaft actually on one side the motor is trying to drive it and on the other side you have that big roll through which you are rolling the material. So, there is a tremendous load here on this shaft and the and the motor is trying to move that. So, on the shaft you have a torsion created. So, the force which the torque which is created by the motor is actually transferred to the roll through the torsion of this shaft. So, now on this shaft if you if you if you put four strain gauges like this as shown and along along 45 degrees then what happens is this. So, in the initial position take a consider a rectangle that is consider a rectangle on the shaft. So, this is the shaft ok. So, now and this is the other end of the shaft. So, now if you rotate it in this fashion, if you to twist it in this fashion, then what will happen is that this will tend this will tend to get in the form of a rhombus and this diagonal will will expand and this diagonal will compress. So, if you put strain gauges along these then what will happen is that now you see that this diagonal will this diagonal will expand 1 and 4 under a tension and 2 and 3 will be under compression. So, now again they will sense opposing uh, they will sense opposing strains and you can put them in a bridge in the same way. So, this is the basic idea. So, you can again put them in a Whetstone's Whetstone's bridge and the torque measured can be inferred this is a formula which is obtained using the mechanics of torsion as well as the bridge uh, sensitivity equation. So, we have come to the end of the lesson. In this lesson we have seen various principles that are used to measure lower pressures and some uh, I mean which is sometimes referred to as vacuum. So, we have seen pressure effect of pressure on thermal conductivity, effect of pressure on uh, the degree of ionization of gas which can be produced and uh, we have also seen. So, uh, so basically these two and then we have seen the other members for example, we have seen the bellows where the pressure as a force is is produces some sort of you know either strain or produces some sort of displacement and that displacement is sensed that is the other common way of measuring pressure and it, this can be this can measure high pressure and the same same similar kind of principles can be used for measuring force using strain gauges by using various configurations of mechanical members like you know sometimes we have rings which are called proving rings, sometimes we have beams, sometimes we have pillar type load cells. So, we have various kinds of load cells which are used for measuring force and we have also seen a similar principle for measuring torque. So, coming to some points to ponder name two physical effects that are used to measure low pressure. These answers are there in the lecture you can try to recapitulate name two secondary sensing elements used in high pressure measurement. Compare the sensitivities of two load cells discussed in this lecture. So, that will depend on uh, the the uh, strength of material considerations, how much of strain is produced for how much of force and finally, mention one industrial application of shaft torque measurement, we have given one uh, application. So, that we end here today, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to this lesson on motion sensing 
in the course on industrial automation and control. So, uh, today our instructional objectives are that we will motion means position, velocity, acceleration. So, today we will and there are various types of uh, motion sensing instruments, but we will only look at those which are of relatively more importance in the context of industrial automation. There are other application areas like aerospace where some of the other kinds of sensors are very important. They are also motion sensors, but we will not uh, look at them per se. So, the first objective is that there are some basic techniques by which we will see that how changes in position can be converted to changes in resistance, changes in capacitance or change in inductance. Sometimes, you know, changes in mutual inductance. So, and then once we, so that is the first step where we are converting this mechanical motion into an electrical parameter change. After that, we can employ standard signal conditioning circuitry for which are, which are there for you know sensing these changes. So, we will learn about the signal conditioning circuitry at another in, in another lesson. So, right now we will show how predominantly we will show that how these uh, how the motion actually translates into changes of resistance, capacitance or inductance. So, that is the second one of the major applications is measuring speeds of rotating machines because rotating machines are a very important class of actuators in in the industry and they have to be controlled. So, for the purpose of controlling it is very important that we uh, measure their not only their position, but also because position measurement is basically angular position measurement. So, we not only measure their position, but we also measure their speed. So, we will see look at some of the methods of measuring speeds of rotating machines. We will also look at some optical methods of measuring speed. Uh, optical methods are uh, very good in some respects and not so good in some others, but they are they are a distinct class of methods. So, we will uh, have a look a brief look at that and we will also look at uh, measurement of acceleration, uh, which is typically done in the industrial context by uh, piezoelectric sensors.